Chapter Nineteen of the Three Midshipmen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Three Midshipmen by william henry giles kingston chapter nineteen in perilous condition the little half-sinking schooner dashed on amid the raging seas now lifted up to the summit of one surrounded by hissing foam now sinking down into the gloomy hollow between others which seemed as if they were about instantly to engulf her again another sea struck her and had not every one held on tight to the rigging or bulwarks her deck would have been cleared as it made a clean wash fore and aft we must not run this risk again exclaimed murray all hands go below one on deck is enough i'll take the helm no expostulation adair remember i am commanding officer i am determined to do it adair with a bad grace was obliged to obey with the rest they all went below and murray battened down the hatches lashing himself to the helm he alone remained on deck through that fearful gale the sea roared around the little vessel the wind whistled through the shrouds fierce lightning darted from the dark heavy clouds the thunder rattled in deafening peals while deluges of rain and spray flew about his head and almost blinded him yet undaunted as at the first he stood like some spirit of the storm at his dangerous post those below tried to sleep to pass away the time but so fearful was the tumult that sleep refused to visit even the seamen's eyes hour after hour passed by still by the noise and the movement of the vessel it was too evident that the gale continued adair calculated that it must be already be almost day just then the vessel became more steady and the noise of the storm considerably diminished adair was surprised that murray did not take off the hatches he was anxious to go on deck to relieve him he knocked and knocked again on the skylight he called and called out again and again there was no answer with frantic energy he attempted to bust open the skylight the dreadful idea seized him that murray his brave and noble friend had been washed overboard and lost he and his companions again knocked several times still there was no answer they themselves were almost stifled with the heat of the atmosphere and the odor of the rotting tobacco and monkey skins this will never do exclaimed adair becoming more and more alarmed for murray's safety we must force the hatches off or break our way through the skylight they groped about and found a handspike which had been chucked down below now lads heave he cried adair and getting the end under the skylight with a loud crash they prized it off and one after the other sprang on deck there stood murray lashed to the helm and looking more like a man in a trance than one awake hello where am i he exclaimed gazing wildly around on the deck of the venus old fellow answered terence taking him by the hand right gallantly you steered us through the gale and as soon as it fell calm you dropped asleep and small blame to you we did the same below and i cannot tell you how glad i am to see you safe we all thought you had fallen overboard murray was very much surprised to find that he had slept so long and so soundly but he soon gave evidence that he had not had enough rest for adair had a mattress brought up and stretched under an awning on deck and the moment he placed his head on it he was off again as soundly as before we must turn to at the pumps sir observed needham coming from below if we don't bear a hand i fear the craft will sink under us 
such it appeared would probably be the case but no one was daunted all set to work and labor away as manfully as before when murray awoke he found that the schooner was again almost cleared of water the last man to leave the pumps was wasser he was still laboring away when down he sank on the deck murray and adair ran to lift him up he could scarcely open his eyes and looked thoroughly worn out they lifted the poor fellow to the mattress from which murray had just risen and as soon as the fire which had gone out could be lighted they made some beef broth which they poured down his throat they also gave him a little rum alec and terence differed as to which was the best restorative but unlike doctors in general they agreed to administer them alternatively paddy wanted to give them in equal proportions that is to say for every cup of broth alec gave he wanted to give a glass of grog but fortunately to this arrangement murray would not consent he argued that one tumbler of grog half and half was stronger than a dozen basins of broth and he would therefore allow only half a tumbler in the day when wasser was at length able to speak to adair's astonishment he declared in favor of the remedy of the rival practitioner and murray and his broth carried the day in spite of the heat wasser had to be carried below and all who could were glad to take shelter there for down came the rain with terrific force and continued without intermission almost swamping the little vessel her crew had worked enough to do all their time in keeping her clear of the water which poured in through the leaks in bucketfuls for days and nights together no one had on a dry jacket by such observations as they could manage to make murray and adair began to suspect that all their seamanship was set at naught for though they at times made some way through the water they as quickly lost all the ground they had gained and thus it became evident that there was a strong current against them this is dreadfully trying exclaimed terence after they had become convinced of this disagreeable fact let us try and make the land again and see whereabouts we are perhaps by hugging the shore we may be able to get round cape palmas after all murray agreed to this proposal although he was not very sanguine of success he knew that the currents were probably as strong inshore as where they then were but he hoped that they might possibly get a slant of wind off the land which would enable them to stem the current and help them along round the cape murray has been making his calculations on paper i could scarcely have believed that we could have been so unfortunate he observed looking calmly up for the last six days we have not made good more than four or five miles perhaps scarcely so much i have no wish to pay another visit to cape coast castle though i dare say the old governor would be as kind to us as before i agree with you answered adair let us stick at it we must get the wind in our favor some day or other it does not always blow from the norard i suppose like true british sailors they did stick at it such is the spirit which has animated the numerous brave voyagers who have explored the arctic regions the southern seas and the wide-spreading pacific at length the land was made it was a long way however to the southward or rather to the eastward of cape palmas the wind fell soon afterwards and slowly they drifted in towards the shore their glasses as they approached were directed at it and they could see a number of blacks collected on the beach and evidently watching them the part of the coast they were now off is called the ivory coast as far as an eye could reach it was flat and monotonous but along its whole extent appeared rich groves of coconut trees extending a considerable distance inland 
here and there embosomed by the coconut groves they could see small villages and separate buildings the cottages with high conical roofs thatched with palmetto leaves to the east appeared a long thin spit of sand separated from the main beach by a lagoon into which several rivers and streams appeared to fall as they approached the shore a terrific surf was seen rolling in towards it and breaking with a loud roar on the sand what will become of our little craft if we get in among those breakers said adair she will have hard work to swim i suspect i doubt if she will ever float through them answered murray if she does and we are stranded what is the best fate we can then hope to happen to us i fear that those black gentry on the shore will not give us a very friendly reception they are flourishing their spears as if they would like to dig them into us we shall be completely in their power and what is the worst we have not the means of showing fight said adair watching the people on the shore through his glass they have some big canoes hauled up on the beach and they seem disposed to launch them and come in chase of us should the rollers not send us to them i wish that there was a chance of that exclaimed murray i should have very little fear of them if they came to attack us ah there's a puff of wind off the shore our blacks have discovered it they are wetting their fingers and holding up their hands we may yet be able to stand off the land the minutes passed slowly by they were full of the most anxious suspense now the promised breeze died away and the little vessel floated helplessly in towards the dreaded surf now it came on again and she was able to get a little further off again to be left to drift back towards the land then just as her case seemed hopeless another puff would come and once more her sails would fill and all on board hoped that she would make a good offing had they possessed sweeps with the help of the transient breeze they might have got to the safe distance from the land as to anchoring that was out of the question even had there been a bottom to be found with such an inset their cables would not have held them for an instant when the schooner got near enough to the shore they saw that the natives were still watching them eagerly and no sooner did the breeze return than preparations were made to launch several of their canoes from the gestures of the blacks murray and adair agreed that their intentions did not appear to be friendly and therefore it would be wise to avoid them altogether if they could and at all events to be prepared to receive them warmly should they overtake the schooner her progress was very slow and there appeared too great a prospect of their doing this every preparation was therefore made for such a contingency the wind was light but it appeared to be increasing and by degrees it was evident that the little craft was forging ahead more and more rapidly through the smooth shining ocean the negroes on shore must have seen that their chance of overtaking her was every moment lessening and they observed to make several strenuous efforts to launch their canoes through the surf the first two were capsized and sent back on the beach which the people in her or rather out of her very easily regained as if perfectly accustomed to that mode of proceeding again however the canoes were righted and launched and this time four gained the open sea the fifth was driven back and probably received some damage for she was not again launched four large canoes full of strong active negroes completely armed according to their own fashion were antagonists not to be despised still it was evident that they had not firearms 
or that if they had they must have been rendered completely useless from the thorough drenching they must have got night was drawing on the wind in a few minutes drew more round to the eastward and gave signs of once more dropping of course every inch of canvas the little venus could carry was set on her so that unless the breeze increased it was impossible to make her go faster than she was doing through the water and yet she was keeping well ahead of the canoes the two midshipmen anxiously watched the proceedings of the latter the blacks in the stern sheets were standing up and gesticulating and flourishing their clubs and lances and encouraging their companions the sun at length went down and with the last gleam of light shed by his rays they could see the canoes still in pursuit darkness however now rapidly rose over the deep and hid them from their view murray wisely bethought him of altering the schooner's course more to the southward for a short time nearly an hour passed and there was no sign of the canoes they had therefore little apprehension that they would overtake them the schooner was hauled up again on a wind the night passed away and when morning broke neither the canoes nor the land were in sight if the breeze lasts we may hope to regain the ground we lost last night observed murray but it did not and when once more they reached in towards the land they found that they had made as little progress as before again too their provisions were running short though they might catch some fish the supply was uncertain we shall have to bear up again for cape coast castle after all i'm afraid observed adair to murray and really alick if i were you i would leave the old craft there and let us find our way as best we can to sierra leone yet of course if you resolve to continue the voyage i'll stick by you you'll not think i hesitated about that point i know full well that you'd not desert me paddy even if things were ten times as bad as they are answered murray but you also know me well enough not to suppose that i would disobey my orders and abandon the schooner while she holds together if she gets a slight repair with a fresh supply of provisions she will be as well able to perform the voyage as she was at first there is no use starving though and as we have scarcely anything left to eat on board we'll keep away at once for cape coast castle the order to put out the helm was received with no little satisfaction by needham and the rest and in less than three days the schooner was riding safely at anchor before the old fort the governor received the two midshipmen with the greatest kindness well my lads said he i suppose you have had enough of this knocking about in your rotten old tub and will not object to leave her this time we shall soon have a man of war here which will carry you up to sierra leone and i will bear you free from all blame with your captain or any one else you should no longer risk your own lives or those of your people in such a vessel i'm much obliged to you sir said murray i've made up my mind long ago on the matter but i am willing to let any of the people leave me who wish it and will try to get others in their stead the governor who really was anxious about the safety of the young officer whose perseverance he very much admired the next day went on board the schooner hoping to persuade the crew to abandon her and expecting to gain his point under the belief that no other people would be obtained to go in her they assembled on deck the governor addressed them murray said nothing i'll stick by my officers said needham touching his hat and going behind murray not another word did he utter so do i sir said white doing the same wasser and the other blacks grinning from ear to ear and scratching their woolly pates followed needham and white murray felt much gratified 
there sir said he to the governor you see that my men will not desert me or the ship we are bound to continue the voyage i give up all hope of preventing you said the kind-hearted governor with a sigh however as you go will we will try to make you as comfortable as we can the governor was as good as his word and provisions and stores of all sorts were sent on board there was little chance of their starving this time though that of their going to the bottom was not much diminished as few means were procurable of giving anything like a substantial repair to the little craft among other gifts alex and terence received a couple of parrots and a monkey the first two were presented to murray the latter to adair the little craft was once more pronounced ready for sea they had been employed all day in setting up the rigging and in bending sails when one of the men proposed a swim overboard to cool themselves after the heat to which they had been subject in an instant all hands were in the water swimming about round and round the vessel the boat was in the water on the starboard side murray intending to bathe afterwards was alone on deck suddenly he saw the ill-omened fin of a shark rising above the water at no great distance off and then his snout appeared and his wicked eyes were visible surveying the scene of action murray shouted to adair and the rest of the people to come on board no one lost an instant in attempting to obey the order wasser alone was on the port side at the moment and nearest to where the shark had appeared he was a good swimmer as he had before shown and instead of singing out for a rope with which to climb up on that side he struck out to pass around the schooner's stern it was a fatal resolve murray was watching the ominous fin it disappeared swim towards the stern swim towards the stern splash about with your legs wasser he cried out running aft and heaving the poor negro a rope catch hold of this my lad catch hold of this wasser made a spring at the rope for instinctively he was aware what was behind him he had half lifted himself out of the water when he uttered a fearful shriek the monster shark had seized him by the legs in vain he struggled in vain murray hauled away to drag him out of the water the ferocious fish would not let go his hold the poor negro shrieked again and again by that time terence and needham had climbed on board and coming to murray's assistance they leaned over the counter and seizing wasser by the arms pulled him up still farther out of the water and then white joining them with a boat hook drove the point into one of the monster's eyes when he at length opened his jaws and retreated to a short distance still however watching his writhing prey as if ready to make another attack it would be too horrible were i to describe the dreadful condition in which the shark had left poor wasser's legs one foot was entirely gone while the other leg was bare to the bone a mattress was got up on deck and murray and adair with all the skill they could command set to work to doctor the negro lad while they sent off to the port for assistance no use thank ye masses said wasser shaking his head doctor no do good my time come me die happy once me thought fetish take me now me know where me go who wait for me he pointed solemnly upward as he spoke the deathbed of that poor black lad might well be envied by many a proud white man wasser's predictions proved not unfounded when the doctor came on board he pronounced his case utterly hopeless and as wasser himself entreated that he might not be sent on shore he was allowed to remain where he was all night the two midshipmen and needham sat up watching him and doing their best to relieve his pain at daybreak they were to get under way and with the dying lad on board they once more left cape coast castle 
and shaped a course for sierra leone the wind still continued light and in order to keep them from gloomy thoughts or apprehensions murray set all hands to work to fish they had plenty of lines and bait this time and as they sailed along the sea seemed literally alive with fish of every description there were bonettas and dolphins and skipjacks without number all affording sport and very pleasant provender while the seamen's arch enemies the sharks cruised round them as if they had made up their minds that they were to become their prey poor wasser had lingered on from day to day it appeared that each hour would prove his last when just at daybreak on the fourth morning after leaving harbour he called murray with a faint voice to his side me go massa me go up dere good-bye he whispered and with his hand pointing upward he fell back his arms dropped by his side and murray saw that the faithful lad was dead a funeral at sea is often an impressive ceremony that of poor wasser was short for though there were few in attendance it was not the least sad for his gentle and obliging manners and his coolness and courage in danger he had won the affection and respect of all with whom he had sailed the body was sewn securely up in his blankets and hammock with such heavy weights that as could be spared fastened to the feet and when launched overboard after murray had read the funeral service it shot quickly out of sight well tom i don't think as how jack shark would be able to grab the poor fellow before he gets safely down to the bottom i do not know exactly what sort of notions sailors have of the bottom of the ocean but i rather think they have an idea that it is a comfortable sort of a place where people can spend their time pleasantly enough if they can but once contrive to reach it without being caught by a shark or other marine monster when they had got over the feelings produced by wasser's death the little crew managed to amuse themselves tolerably well murray taught his parrots to sing and whistle and to talk till they became wonderfully tame and fond of him while paddy contrived to instruct his monkey queer face as he called him so well that he fully rivalled his old friend quirk on board the racer paddy used to observe that as queer face could act like a human being while the parrots could talk like one their united talents would enable them to make a very fair representation of a young savage or indeed of some of his acquaintances who considered themselves polished young gentlemen but often acted no better than monkeys and, and scarcely knew the meaning of what they were saying more than they did the parrots there was no fear of the parrots flying away so they were allowed full liberty and in calm weather they used to sit on the rigging nodding their heads and cleaning their feathers and talking away with the greatest glee till queerface who had been watching them from the deck would take it into his head to spring up the rigging after them and chase them from shroud to shroud or they would keep out of his reach by circling round and round round the vessel completely laughing at his beard one day a huge shark was seen following the vessel i wonder what he wants with us exclaimed paddy gravely if we do not catch him perhaps he will catch one of us such a notion is a mere superstition observed murray however we will try and catch him a bonetta had been caught and that it was agreed would serve as a good bait for the shark there was no hook on board large enough to secure him so another plan was adopted by needham's suggestion the bonetta was secured to a small line while the end of the peak halyards a running bowline knot was formed and placed over it or rather round it the fish was thus in the very centre of the hoop or slipknot it might be called but a short distance before it 
we shall have that gentleman no fear of it observed paddy as he watched the shark dart forward towards the bait murray managed the line with the bait paddy kept the bowline to draw it tight when the shark should get his head well into it silently and cautiously the monster glided on his cruel green eye on the bonetta which murray gradually withdrew till it was close up to the counter then suddenly the shark afraid of losing his prey made a dart at the fish till the bowline was just behind his two hind fins when paddy giving a sudden jerk to it brought it tight around him the men when they saw this endeavoured to catch a turn with the rope to secure the monster but quick as lightning he gave a terrific jerk to the rope and tore it through their hands out flew the rope unhappily paddy was standing in the middle of the coil and before he could jump out of it a half hitch was caught around his leg hold on hold on lads he shrieked out oh murray help it was too late he was drawn up right over the gunwale but just as he was going overboard he seized hold of the peak halyards where they were belayed to the side and held on like grim death the shark tugged and tugged away terribly he could hold no longer he felt his fingers relaxing their grasp and in another moment he would have been dragged under the water with small chance of escape when needham seized him firmly by the jacket ned however forgot that it would be necessary for him to get a grasp at something but before he had done so he found himself dragged over with paddy at that moment white sprang up and grasped hold of his legs just as they were disappearing over the gunwale and at the same time sambo the other black caught hold of white who would inevitably otherwise have followed needham and thus poor murray saw himself in a moment about to be deprived of his brother officer and crew he himself now sprang to their assistance all i have been describing took place within a few seconds of time with a boat hook fortunately at hand he got hold of paddy's jacket which considerably relieved needham and at the same moment the shark coming up again towards the schooner he and needham were hauled on board again his leg being happily released from the coil which had caught it without the necessity of cutting the rope poor paddy's leg was however dreadfully mangled and unable to stand he sank down with pain on the deck queerface was all the time chattering and jumping about in a state of greatest excitement evidently understanding somewhat of his master's danger and no sooner did adair regain the deck than he ran up and squatting down by his side made so ludicrous a face that in spite of his pain terence could not help bursting out into a fit of laughter which as he afterwards remarked must wonderfully have relieved poor queer face's mind the shark meantime was hauled on board though when they had got him thus far he flapped about and struggled so violently that he almost took the deck from the crew little mercy had he to expect from their hands his enemies now attacked him with anything which first came in their way but they made little impression on him while his head was the chief point of assault queerface chattered away and skipped about taking very good care however to keep clear of him and the parrots polly and nelly sang and talked as vehemently as if very much interested in the scene till sambo the black cook watching his opportunity rushed in with his cleaver and gave the monster a, a blow on the upper part of his tail which in an instant quieted him not another flap did he give with the tail or fin his huge jaws closed and he was dead 
after all their trouble he was of no great use to them they cut a few slices out of him for frying for seamen will often eat shark's flesh with much the same feeling that a fiji islander or a new zealander a few years ago used to eat their enemies taken in war his skin however was of some value and that accordingly they took off and preserved poor paddy suffered very great pain from his hurt the only remedy any one on board could think of applying was oil and with that they continued to bathe it literally as it did just as well afterwards to burn in the lamps the wet season was not yet over day after day they had torrents of rain so that no one on board had a dry rag on their backs the schooner too grew more and more leaky and the cargo of tobacco more and more rotten till the odour arising from it was scarcely bearable and at length they were completely driven out of their cabins often they wished to heave it overboard but they dared not for had they done so the vessel already somewhat crank would certainly have capsized still whenever the two midshipmen could get a glimpse of the sun they took their observations and they found that they were making progress though slowly to the northward can you believe it paddy exclaimed murray you have been on board here upwards of three months and four have passed away since i was placed in command of her still my motto is persevere and i intend to stick to it right gallantly did the little crew follow his example a few days after this on taking their observations they found that they had in their last twenty-four hours made good no less than forty miles and two days after that they went over fifty miles of ground this put all hands in good spirits and adair's leg getting better he was once more able to move about as before they even began to fancy that all their trials were over and that they should make an easy passage to sierra leone but they were mistaken that very evening the sky gave signs of a change of weather the wind began to moan in the rigging white crests rose on the summits of the seas which increased rapidly in size as they rolled tumultuously around them all the canvas was closely reefed when the gale came down upon the schooner she stood bravely up to it on her course till it increased in strength the lightning darting from the clouds with a vividness and the thunder rattling and crashing with a fury which no one on board had ever before experienced sometimes so intense was the heat of the electric fluid as it passed round and about them that they expected to be actually scorched by it if they happily escaped being struck dead the rain all the time came down in torrents leaking through the deck and half filling the vessel which was also letting in the water at every seam they had not thus a moment for rest for they soon found it necessary to keep the pumps going all the time at length the gale ceased but it left them in a deplorable condition with the leaks much increased and their sails in tatters all the canvas had been expended and it seemed impossible to repair them till they bethought them of the monkey skins in the hold and as soon as the wind fell they were lowered down and all hands turned to for the purpose of mending them with this novel contrivance we shall do very well now exclaimed adair when once more they were set but my friend queerface does not seem quite to understand the joke of seeing his brothers and sisters stretched out there before him and i should say feels remarkably uncomfortable in his own skin lest we should some day think it necessary to make use of his hide in the same way for three or four days they ran on to the northward when down came another gale upon them which gave every sign of being heavier than the first 
i will have no man's life exposed unnecessarily to this fearful lightning exclaimed murray as flash after flash darted vividly around them night had just come on between the intervals of the flashes the darkness was such as could be felt adair attempted to expostulate and the rest would gladly have disobeyed orders but murray was firm and insisted on being left alone as before well my dear fellow mind you don't go to sleep observed adair as with the crew queerface and the two parrots he dived down into the noisome little cabin hour after hour murray gallantly stood to the helm the little schooner dashing through the foaming seas for he judged it better to keep her on her course than to heave her to terrifically the thunder rolled crash succeeded crash almost without cessation while the lightning darted from the sky and played with even more fearful vividness round the little vessel than on the former night still murray undaunted stood at his post with perfect calmness though he scarcely expected to escape it was not the calmness of despair or stoicism but that which the most perfect trust in god's mercy and all just government of human affairs can alone give if he thinks fit to call me hence his will be done he repeated to himself over and over again during that dreadful night several times adair anxious for his safety lifted a little scuttle which had been contrived in the skylight and inquired how he got on and at times wondered at the fearless tone in which he replied still the danger of foundering was to be feared for what with the torrents of rain from the skies and the opening leaks the little vessel was rapidly filling with water dawn was at length breaking and the wind was decreasing when as murray looked round he thought he saw a vessel to windward bearing down upon them just at that instant a cry arose from below that the schooner was sinking and adair and the crew leaped on deck the pump was instantly rigged and they worked away at it with a will still the water appeared to be gaining on them on came the stranger she was a large and fine schooner as the wind had decreased she was making sail rapidly she neared them there could be little doubt from her appearance that she was a slaver to offer any resistance should she wish to capture them would be out of the question their hearts sank within them just then the glitter of some gold lace on the cap of an officer standing on the schooner's poop caught adair's eye he seized his telescope and directly afterwards a cheer came down to them as the schooner shooting up into the wind prepared to heave to huzza huzza exclaimed adair it's all right there can be no doubt of it there's jack rogers himself end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the three midshipmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ron johnson the three midshipmen by william henry giles kingston Chapter Twenty: Slave Hunting. The big schooner and the Venus were soon hove to, and while the two vessels were bowing and bobbing away at each other, a boat was lowered from the quarter of the former, which came dashing over the seas, urged by four stout hands towards them. Jack Rogers sat in the stern sheets. He sprang on board and grasped Alex's and Terence's hands. For nearly a minute he could not speak. He looked at one and then at the other my dear fellows you do look terribly pulled down he exclaimed at length still i am glad to see you even as you are the truth is it has been thought you were lost when week after week passed and you did not appear many of them gave you up altogether and thought that you and the schooner had gone to the bottom but i never entirely lost heart i could have borne it if i had and i was certain that you would turn up somewhere or other what have you been about 
The story was soon told. That's just like you, cried Jack again, wringing Murray's and then Patty's hand. You are right. A fellow should do anything rather than desert his colors. I am glad indeed that you've got safe through it. But I say the craft seems to be moving in a very uneasy way. What is the matter? If we don't keep the pumps going, she'll be going down in a few minutes, put in Needham, touching his hat. Jack called his crew out of the boat, and all hands set to work at the pumps. It was high time, for the crazy little craft was settling fast down in the water. Four fresh hands pumping away, while the rest bailed once more, got the leaks under, and in a couple of hours Jack returning on board his schooner, sail was made for Sierra Leone. The schooner was a prize lately captured by the ranger, and Captain Lascelles had put Jack in charge of her to carry her up to Sierra Leone, while the frigate continued her cruise to the southward. He was to find his way back to his ship by the first man of war calling at the port. Jack wished very much that he could remain on board the Venus to keep up, as he said, his friend's spirits, but as he had two or three hundred slaves on board his prize, he had to return to her to preserve order. He promised, however, to stay by the Venus, come what might, and Alec and Patty had no fear that he would desert them. He lent them a couple of hands to work at the pumps, but even with this assistance, they had the greatest difficulty in keeping the schooner afloat. If another gale should spring up, I really do not think the craft would keep afloat an hour, exclaimed the dare with a ruthful countenance, after he had been pumping away for an hour till he was, as he said, like Niobe, all tears or a water nymph. Then we must let her sink, answered Alec calmly. We have done our best to keep her above water, though it would be hard to bear if, after all, we should be unable to carry her into Sierra Leone. Never fear, Alec, exclaimed Patty warmly. As long as any of us have life in our bodies, we'll pump away, depend on that. If pumping can do it, we'll keep the old craft afloat. Not the least anxious of the many hours they had passed on board the Venus were those they had now to endure. Jack Rogers, however, kept close to them, so that they had no fear about their lives. It was with no slight satisfaction, therefore, that at length they heard the cry from the foretopmast head of the Felicidade, Jack's prize of land ahead, and soon afterwards the high cape of Sierra Leone hove in sight. They ran up the river above five miles when they came to an anchor off Freetown, the picturesque capital of the colony. It is backed by a line of lofty heights of different shapes and sizes, which are covered to their summits with trees, and add much to the beauty of the scenery, the sugar loaf rising in the distance behind them. The river immediately in front of the town forms a bay, which affords good anchorage to vessels of all classes. The town rises with a gentle ascent from the banks of the river, and presents a very good appearance for nearly a mile long, and the streets are broad and intersect each other at right angles. The town is open to the river on the north, but on the east, south, and west, it is hemmed in by the wood-crowned hills, which are about a mile or so from it, the intervening space being filled up with undulating ground, forming altogether a scene of great beauty. Here and there in the distance could be seen the palm-thatched roofs of the cottages, which form several villages scattered about on the sides of the hills, and all united by good roads. What a pleasant place this would be to live in, if it wasn't for the yellow fever and the coast fever and a few other little disagreeables, observed the dare to Murray, as they stood on the deck of the Venus waiting for Jack Rogers, who was coming to take them on shore. Meantime, Needham and the rest of the crew were still hard at work at the pumps to keep the craft afloat. The schooner's sails being stowed, Rogers was soon alongside. With no little satisfaction, they stepped into his boat. Just as they were shoving off, Queerface, who had hitherto been looking over the side, chatting in the most voluble manner, made a spring and leaped in after them, and took his seat aft as if he thought himself one of them, as Patty remarked. He looked about him in so comical a way that they all burst into fits of laughter, and when they tried to catch him to put him on board again, he leaped about so nimbly that they were obliged to give up the chase and allow him to accompany them on shore. If Master Queerface was asked, 
I have not the slightest doubt, but that he would say, there were four of us in the boat now, said Patty, laughing. Just see what a conceited look the little chap puts on, eh, Master Queerface? You think yourself a very fine fellow now. Cack, 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 went Queerface, looking about him in the most self-satisfied manner. Hello, who comes here? cried Jack as the boat was nearing the shore. He pointed at the Venus, whence two large parrots were seen flying towards them. Those are my pets, exclaimed Murray, laughing. We should in England be looked upon as the advertising members of some traveling menagerie. When they got on shore, Queerface walked alongside Patty with the greatest gravity, except that he every now and then turned round to grin at the little negro boys who followed, making fun at him in a way he did not approve of. One of them, more daring than the rest, tried to tweak him by the tail when he made chase in so heroic a manner that he put them all to flight. Meantime, Polly and Nelly, the parrots, kept flying above their heads and occasionally alighting to rest on Murray's shoulder. Sometimes, for a chance, one of them would pitch on the head or back of Master Queerface, with whom they were on the most friendly terms. The dangers they had gone through together seemed to have united them closely in the bonds of unity. Thus the party proceeded till they reached the governor's house. They in vain tried to keep out Queerface and the parrots, but the governor, hearing the disturbance, desired that all hands should be admitted. He was highly amused at the pertinacity with which the parrots and monkeys stuck to their masters, and still more interested with the account Murray and Adair gave of their voyage. Indeed, he gained, as they deserved, great credit for the way in which they had stuck to their vessel. All three midshipmen were treated with the greatest kindness by the residents of Freetown, so that they had a very pleasant time of it, and were in no hurry for the arrival of a vessel to carry them back to their ships. They made friends in all directions, both among the higher as well as among the less exalted grades of society. Indeed, they were general favorites. Even Queerface and Polly and Nelly came in for some share of the favor they enjoyed. For although neither monkeys nor parrots can be said to be scarce in Africa, their talents were so great and of so versatile a character that their society was welcomed almost, Adair declared, as much as that of their masters. Queerface more than once, however, got into disgrace. The three midshipmen were spending the day at the house of a kind of old gentleman a short distance from the town. It was a cool and airy a place, and as pleasant an abode as could be found under the burning sun of Africa, surrounded with broad verandas, French windows, and Venetian blinds. The hour of dinner arrived, and all the family assembled in the dining room, but Mr. Wilkie, the host, did not make his appearance. They began to get anxious about him, and some of the ladies hurried off to call him, when at length he came up the room laughing heartily with a white nightcap on his head. I must apologize, ladies and gentlemen, he said, but the truth is I wear a wig, a fact you are probably aware of, but while I was taking my siesta, somebody came and took my wig away. Sambo and Julius Caesar and Ariadne have been hunting high and low and on every side without success, and what is extraordinary, my dressing gown disappeared at the same time. However, I hope that you will excuse me, for I thought it better to appear as I am than not at all, for I confess it, I have but two wigs, and my other one has been left at the barber's to be refizzled. Some dreadful suspicions came over Patty's mind when he heard this, and his fears were not allayed when he heard a loud chattering, and presently Queerface, with Polly and Nelly, appeared at the open window, the former with the missing wig on his head, and the dressing gown over his shoulders. In he popped, nothing daunted, and seeing an empty chair, the intended occupant had died of the coast fever that morning, he squatted himself down in it, and began bowing and grinning away round to all the company. Patty began to scold him, but Queerface merely lifted a glass which stood near him and nodded his head at him in the most cool and impudent way, as much as to say, We understand each other perfectly. We are both men of the world. Then he turned to the master of the house and steadfastly looking at his white nightcap, adjusted the wig he had stolen in the most comical manner. Everybody present all the time was roaring with laughter, in which no one joined more heartily than did the master of the house. Come, come, Master Queerface, I want back my wig, he exclaimed at last. 
My wig, old fella, my wig. Ha, ha, ha. But not a bit of it. Queerface was evidently too delighted with the ornament of his pate to think of abandoning it, and the more vehement were the signs Mr. Wilkie made, the tighter did he haul it down over his ears. As he sat up in a big chair, with a colored dressing gown over his shoulders, and the wig hanging down on each side of his head, Patty declared that he looked exactly like a judge on the bench. "'Will you or will you not give me up my wig?' at length exclaimed the owner of it, but Queerface held it tighter than ever. "'Take that, then!' cried Mr. Wilkie, recollecting a well-known story of his youth, and seizing his white nightcap he flung it at Queerface. The monkey was not slow to imitate the example, but whipping off the wig, he threw it at the owner with one hand, while he caught the white cap with the other, and soon his ugly mug was grinning with delight from under it. Mr. Wilkie, having delivered over his wig to one of his negro servants to be brushed and cleansed, begged his guests and family to begin dinner. Adair and his brother midshipman apologized for the behavior of their companion, but he assured them that he would not have missed the fun on any account, and that his wig was not a bit the worse for having been worn by the monkey. After dinner, they strolled out to see a monkey-bred tree, the baobab, a huge monster which Mr. Wilkie asserted was three or four thousand years old. It was not more than seventy feet high, but the stem was close upon thirty feet in diameter with immensely long roots, while the boughs hung down to the ground, forming altogether a wonderful mass of verdure. A jolly abode for the monkeys, observed Adair. I wonder whether my friend Queerface would like to take up his lodging there if I were to leave him on shore. Queerface seemed to understand the remark, and jumping up on Adair showed no inclination to leave him. Murray had held up wonderfully during all the hardships he had undergone, and even after he came on shore, he was able for some time to go about, but a few days after this the fever, which had been hovering about him, seized him. He would have had to go to the hospital, but Mr. Wilkie sent litter for him, and had him carried to his own house, and nursed him as if he had been his son. Jack and Terence went there every day, and assisted him in nursing him. But for long he appeared to be hovering between life and death. Often his two messmates left him with sad and sorrowing hearts, believing that they might never see him again. At last he rallied and seemed to be getting better. Now they longed for a ship, because they hoped that breathing again the pure sea air, unmixed with any exhalation from the land, might restore him. He was at last able to accompany them about the town. Everybody will remember old Hobnail, the colored boot and shoemaker at Freetown. What a jolly, good-natured, genial-hearted man he was. Every naval officer was welcome at his shop, not because he wanted to make customers of them, for it seemed all the same to him whether they bought his boots and shoes, but really from his genuine kindness of heart. He had a little room, cool and at the same time airy, with the last newspaper from England and lemonade or some other refreshing beverages, and not unfrequently a cigar of a quality rarely to be surpassed. Hopnell's shop, as may be supposed, was often visited by the three midshipmen. They were good customers, too, for Murray and Adair had worn out their shoes before landing, and Jack very soon finished off his with walking about. The first ship which looked into the river was the ranger herself, and as it was very important for Murray's health that he should get afloat, Captain Lascelles carried him off, as well as his own two midshipmen with, of course, Queerface and the two parrots. The ranger went away to the southward, where she cruised without much success. Those only who have been long on the coast know what dreary work it often is, how homesick many poor fellows become, how easily, when the coast fever gets hold of them, the destroyer gains the victory. They had been some two or three weeks at sea, when a man-of-war schooner fell in with them, and handed a letter-bag from England with some letters from Sierra Leone. Murray got several, one from the latter place. It was from no less a person than Mr. Hobnail, who had taken a great fancy to him. It ran as follows. Honored and respected sir, you are a member of that profession which I deem the most noblest and most praiseworthy of any in which man is employed, and more especially that branch of it which is engaged, like that of the squadron on this coast, in relieving suffering humanity 
and thus i feel a great satisfaction in the privilege i enjoy of indicting a few lines to make inquiries respecting you i trust dear sir that you may now be enjoying that sea brisetical health which a residence on the bounding billows of the free ocean is calculated to bestow may you soon again return to this truly charming and delectable though much and unjustly abused town when i may again have the pleasure of holding those agreeable conversations on subjects of interest which have formed the solace of many hours which might otherwise have been spent in the society of ungenial spirits whose base-born spirits cannot soar to those exalted heights of poetical sentiment in which i it must be confessed with due humbleness delight to roam hoping soon to receive a response congenial to my heart no more at present from your attached friend if i may take the liberty of so calling myself peter hobnail the worthy shoemaker's epistle caused great amusement in the midshipman's berth and murray lost no time in replying to it in a strain which he hoped would be congenial to mr hobnail's heart the ship was some way to the southward and had stood in for the land at a place called elephant bay the boats were sent on shore to bring off water the weather being fine and the state of the surf allowing of a landing patty and one of the assistant surgeons were in one boat while the casks were being filled they came to a shallow pool where the medico discovered a quantity of leeches these will be most welcome on board he exclaimed we have been out of them for some time and mr mccann will be most thankful for a supply patty had been carrying a jar for fraser the assistant surgeon for the purpose of holding in aquatic specimens of natural history they might fall in with they were all now turned out and the jar filled with leeches they had got further than they intended and when they returned to the beach they found all the boats gone and only one canoe man with crewmen left to bring them off the surf had in the meantime got up however the canoe was as well able to pass through it as any of the other boats we must not run the risk of losing the leeches observed patty i will fasten the jar with a lanyard around my neck and then if the canoe is capsized that will be saved at all events as we can easily scramble into her again this was done and into the surf the canoe was launched she breasted the rising seas bravely for she was very light and her black crew handled her beautifully both adair and fraser thought the last rollers passed and were congratulating themselves on being certain to get on board without a ducking when unexpectedly a white-topped sea rose directly upon them and in a moment they found themselves rolled over into the water they clung to the canoe and the black crew swam round her and striking out before they attempted to right her towed her away entirely from the influence of the breakers patty and fraser had some unpleasant misgivings about sharks but the blacks shouted and shrieked so loudly that if there were any they were kept at a distance they were soon however again seated in the canoe and as the frigate had stood in to meet them it was not long before they were close to her i say doctor i feel some rather unpleasant sensations about my neck observed patty i can't help thinking that some nettlefish must have got hold of me in the water i feel the stinging all over me right down my breast what can it be bear a hand there and get that canoe up alongside sang out the officer of the watch from the deck of the frigate the order was speedily obeyed and the dripping officers and black crew were soon standing on the deck hello patty what's the matter with you exclaimed jack who had been watching the canoe you are all streaming with blood it's a jellyfish got hold of me i conclude answered patty but looking down he saw the jar into which he had put the leeches dangling at his neck but the cork was out so were the leeches and they of course had fixed themselves to the first body with which they had come in contact this was patty's neck they had just now begun to drop off and streamlets of blood were running down from him in every direction poor patty was indeed a most pitiable object with his hair all lank and wet hanging down his face for he had lost his hat and he had on only a linen jacket over his flannel shirt inside of which some of the greedy leeches had crawled while the rest hung round his neck and throat their black bodies quickly swelling out and looking like so many pendants of polished ebony 
no sooner did queerface who happened to be up the rigging stunning himself recognize his master than down on deck he scuttled and hurried up to him he seemed very much astonished at the look of the leeches and evidently could not make out what they were adair held out his hand when up he jumped and thrusting his paw down his shirt pulled out a leech which had not yet fixed itself the monkey's first impulse was to put it to his nose towards which the creature made a twist and fixed itself firmly poor queer faced opened his paw and not knowing what had happened off he scuttled again up the rigging with the leech hanging to his nose and apparently not liking the feel of it he had not the courage to pull it off till it dropped off itself on the deck everybody laughed so did adair in spite of the pain and annoyance he was suffering a pretty sort of necklace for a nice young irish gentleman of polite manners and respectable connections he exclaimed still laughing away but i say doctor do bear a hand and get these brutes off me for they are becoming remarkably troublesome that i will my boy answered dr mccann to whom he had spoken you are suffering in my service and i am bound to do my best for you the doctor at once got a dare below and by applying salt to the tails of the leeches made them let go and then a little cooling ointment set him all to rights while the bleeding did him no particular harm it was many a day however before he got rid of the marks of the bites as the appearance of the frigate off the coast put all the slave dealers on the alert captain lascelles adopted a plan which has frequently been successful standing in shore he would suddenly make all sail away either to the northward or southward as if in chase of some vessel and then when the ship could no longer be seen from the land he would heave to and send the boats in shore when very frequently they would pounce upon slave vessels totally unsuspicious of their presence while the boats were on shore watering hemming had with a few hands walked along the coast and ascertained that a number of blacks prisoners of war they were called were collected in the neighborhood and there could be no doubt that a vessel would soon be coming to take them off accordingly the usual ruse was put in practice and the pinnace under the command of hemming with jack rogers and adair left the ship to watch for her murray was still too unwell to engage in any such duty they left the ship in the evening so that it was dark by the time they neared the land hemming had fixed upon a spot among some high rocks where the boat might remain completely concealed either from people on the shore or from any one afloat the only difficulty was finding the way into it among the rocks at night still he hoped to effect that there was a slight crescent moon which shone on the calm waters and showed the white sandy breach and the tall wide top palm trees rising up against the clear sky there hung also over the land a slight gauze-like mist which somewhat distorted objects they rowed steadily on with muffled oars making as little splash as possible starboard a little said hemming to jack who was steering i think that i can make out the opening i want to find yes that's it i'm sure in a few minutes the boat glided in between high ocean-worn rocks round from the waves of the atlantic dashing against them for thousands of years past a grapnel was hove on to the rocks and there she lay as snug as any on board could desire the boat was furnished with a little stove for cooking and they had a good supply of edibles and drinkables on board the latter being however more in the shape of tea coffee and cocoa than spirits having supped all hands turned in to sleep except two an officer and man who sat up to keep watch jack adair and hemming succeeded each other but though they kept their eyes open not a sound could they hear to indicate the approach of any vessel at length the sun rose but hemming determined to remain where he was all day hoping that should a breeze spring up the looked-for slaver might make her appearance hour after hour passed pleasantly enough however for they had no lack of provisions and books and chests and games for the men captain lascelles thought that his seamen wearing out their days under the broiling sun of africa required being amused just as much as the gallant fellows who had been shut up for many dreary months amid the snow and ice of the arctic regions the consequences of his care in that and in a variety of other ways was that he lost fewer men than any other ship on the station at last jack suggested that it might be possible to make a lookout place from the top of one of the rocks he first ordered the men to cut a quantity of seaweed 
and to tie it up in bundles and then getting on to one of the rocks he crawled along on hands and knees till he reached the outer edge when he found a cleft which exactly answered his wishes hauling up the bundles of seaweed he placed them before him so that he could look out without being seen himself without much difficulty he could crawl backwards and forwards to it from the boat he had gone several times when at length early in the afternoon when he made out a sail in the offing he watched her eagerly through his glass she was a felucca and as she drew near he made her out to be a large vessel for her rig and a most rackish wicked-looking craft her very appearance made him certain that she was engaged in no lawful calling at last when he saw her stand into the bay and drop her anchor he hurried back to give the information to hemming jack was for dashing out at once and capturing her but his more cautious superior shook his head no no my boy wait till she has got all her slaves on board and then we'll have her and them too the boat therefore remained snugly hid during daylight jack kept crawling up to his lookout place to see what was going forward at last he came back reporting that a raft had come off from the shore loaded with slaves and that they were being shipped on board the felucca all right observed hemming it will take some time before they get their whole cargo on board then we'll be up and at them does it not strike you that they are a long time getting the slaves on board said jack at last to his superior why yes they are somewhat but it is extraordinary how many poor wretches they will stow away between decks in those small crafts but they take some time packing answered hemming in a whisper probably too the raft is small and does not carry many at a time they waited some time longer till the former sounds continued which showed that the raft was still going backwards and forwards i cannot make it out muttered hemming the villains are a long time about their work they little dream that we are close to them or they would be rather smarter about it some time longer passed and then jack proposed returning to his lookout place to try and make out what was occurring it was no easy undertaking scrambling along over the slippery rocks in the dark with a chance if he lost his hold of a tumble into some dark deep pool or of getting jammed in some crevice or perhaps being caught by some prowling ground shark or other monster of the ocean however he reached the point at which he aimed but he had not been there a minute before he heard that particular sound of heavy blocks working chip 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 he made out clearly the tall pointed latine sails of the felucca rising from her decks and then the sound of the windlass working reached his ears while a breeze not felt below and every moment increasing fanned his cheeks he hurried back as fast as he could to the boat as he sprang on board he exclaimed the felucca is under way and there's a breeze off the land in a moment the crew threw up their oars the boat was shoved off from the rocks and emerging from their hiding place Away she started in chase of the slaver. End of chapter 20 Recording by Ron Johnson Chapter 21 of The Three Midshipmen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlech of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Three Midshipmen by William Henry Giles Kingston. Chapter 21 Desperate Fighting On flew the Felucia, urged by sails and oars. The ranger's boat dashed after her give way my lads give way cried hemming not that his crew required the slightest inducement to pull as hard as they could lay their backs to the oars the felucia had got considerably the start and was going through the water somewhat faster than the man of war's boat the more also she drew off the land the stronger she got the breeze there's no use longer attempting concealment cried hemming the chances are she has made us out already get a blue light ready adair the frigate will see it by this time and be on the lookout for her rogers see to the gun forward 
you may be able to send a shot into the felucia and knock away a spar perhaps these orders were promptly obeyed while jack sprang forward to fire the gun adair's blue light blazing up cast a lurid glare over the figures of the crew as they tugged at their oars and which also extended far away across the surface of the ocean while at the same moment the sharp report of the gun broke the hitherto almost perfect silence of the night jack could not see whether his shot had taken effect but he had some hopes that it had again at hemming's order he fired while as soon as the first blue light had gone out adair lighted another their eyes all the time were ranging the offing to try and discover the whereabouts of the frigate there is her light sir shouted jack from forward and when their own blue light grew dim hers was seen shining like a star floating on the water in the far distance thus they went on burning blue lights at longer intervals though than at first and firing shot after shot at the felucia the slaver bore it at first without attempting to return the compliments but at length when rogers hoped that she, he had hit her her captain seemed to lose patience and she opened fire on the boat in return the latter however especially in the night offered too small an object to be easily hit still one shot came whistling over their heads and another struck the water close to them showing them as paddy said that they were comfortably within range i think that i have winged her shouted jack if so even should the breeze increase and she escape from us the frigate will get hold of her thus time sped on the frigate and her boat showing at intervals their blue lights while the slaver caught between them continued pretty rapidly firing away at the latter still hemming at all events did not feel at all certain that it, the felucia would be caught though the light on her deck could be seen she was growing more and more indistinct as she increased her distance from them at last she ceased firing the breeze too was increasing do you still see her rogers asked hemming no sir answered jack she's vanished altogether into thin air then there's no use firing at her i suppose said paddy to himself some little time longer had passed when jack shouted that he again saw her light away pulled the boats towards it the frigate by sending up a blue light showed that she saw it likewise we'll have her this time at all events cried adair rubbing his hands don't be too sure of that paddy said hemming still towards the light we must pull it was rather heavy work for the people had been now some time at their oars without a moment's rest on they pulled however with renewed vigour fully believing that they were about to pounce down upon the slaver nearer and nearer they drew to the light the felucia must have hove too cried adair it's strange after getting so well ahead she should have given in what hemming thought he did not say some grave suspicions crossed jack's mind there she is though starboard a little he sang out or we shall run into a tub with a light in it oh the scoundrels broke from many lips jack was about to douse the light but hemming told him to let it burn on it will serve as a beacon to us and the felucia's people will not know whether or not we have been deceived by it he observed it now became a question in which direction the slaver had gone on they pulled therefore once more towards the frigate hemming wished to let captain lascelles know what had occurred that he might thus steer a course on which he was most likely to come up with the slaver with the increasing wind the boat would have little chance of overtaking the felucia but by staying where they were the lieutenant hoped that they might possibly cut her off the blue lights and the flashes of the guns had dazzled their eyes and the night seemed darker than ever 
in vain jack peered for some time into the darkness to make out the frigate a thick bank of mist blown off the land lay upon the water suddenly like a dark phantom stalking over the deep the frigate's hull with her tall masts towering up in the sky appeared and had barely time to shout out port the helm pull around the port oars before the boat was close up under her bows very narrowly escaping being run down in another minute they were on the quarter-deck and hemming was reporting to captain lascelles all that had occurred he suggested that while the frigate stood after the felucia in one direction he should be allowed to cruise in the opposite direction to double the chances of falling in with her all he wanted was a further supply of water fuel and provisions to this the captain consented and the boat being furnished with what was required hemming and the two midshipmen again shoved off from the frigate's side jack had of course his faithful rifle with him and he felt pretty certain that should he once get a sight of the enemy he should be able to use it with good effect i have not the slightest compunction about picking off those slaving scoundrels he observed as he was busily employed in loading the piece they seem to be completely lost to all sense of what is right and just such perfectly abandoned sinners that there can be no hope of their reforming so i only feel as if i was destroying a wild beast to prevent it doing further mischief all very right observed hemming most people act from more than one motive and it's well that both should be good it's enough for me that it's my duty to kill the fellows if they don't give in it wanted still nearly an hour to daylight the boat had lost sight of the frigate for some time she had made good way to the northward under sail at length when the first faint streaks of sunlight were observed breaking forth over the land hemming ordered the sail to be lowered by this they had a better chance of seeing the felucia without being seen the lieutenant stood up and slowly moved round scanning every part of the horizon the land breeze had now completely died away and there was not a ripple on the water though the slow-moving glassy undulations which came rolling in and constantly rocking the boat showed that they were not floating on an inland lake jack and adair began to fear that the felucia was not in sight when hemming slowly sank down into his seat again saying quietly as he cast eyes on the boat's compass there she is though out oars starboard the helm a little rogers west northwest that will do give way my lads away glided the boat urged on by sturdy arms in the direction mentioned after pulling some time the light increased and the tops of the felucia's sails appeared above the limited horizon of the rowers once more hemming stood up the slaver lay perfectly becalmed he ordered all hands to breakfast the cocoa was quickly heated and the meal was soon dispatched with good appetite then he allowed those who wished it to smoke for a few minutes and once more the oars being got out away went the boat in the direction of the slaver before long they themselves must have been seen from her deck but to his surprise as hemming looked at her through his glass he saw that her sweeps were not got out nor was any attempt made to escape there she lay rocking slowly on the slow undulating water as if no human being was on board to rule her course as they drew closer still only one person indeed was to be seen on her deck he was walking up and down it with a glass tucked under his arm apparently scarcely noticing their approach hemming naturally suspected treachery he well knew that the slavers were capable of the greatest atrocity he was therefore prepared for any emergency why sir exclaimed jack as they got almost alongside 
i believe that that is my old acquaintance don diego he'll do us a mischief if he can be ready lads to spring on board the moment the boat touches her side cried hemming just before this three or four other men came up from below rubbing their eyes as if lately awoke out of sleep the bowmen the next instant hooked on and the british sailors led by their officers sprang on board the slavers people ran forward and aft to get out of their way except the man at first seen whom jack had no doubt was no other than the old pirate don diego as he called himself good morning gentlemen said he quite coolly making the politest of bows to the lieutenant may i request to know what brings you on board here at this early hour in the morning you are known to be a slaver and we have come to capture you answered hemming bluntly ho 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 cried the don there may be two opinions about that you british officers don't go upon surmises you want proofs and you are welcome to all you can discover the don's coolness rather staggered hemming and the two midshipmen jack was certain that he had seen the slaves carried on board in elephant bay and he had no doubt as to the felucia being the same vessel he had seen in elephant bay to settle this point they lifted off the hatches don't disturb my poor men some of them are asleep below said the don in an ordinary tone of voice hemming however paid very little attention to his remarks but ordered jack and adair to keep a sharp lookout on his movements on deck while he descended below hemming looked round at the dark hold of the supposed slaver but there was no sign of a slave deck nor after a careful search could he find anything to warrant him in detaining her in the forepeak a rather numerous crew for the size of the vessel were asleep or pretending to be asleep for some lifted up their heads even to have a look at the intruders at length hemming returned on deck i told you so gentlemen said the don making another excessively polite bow suspicions as i remarked are not proofs i might now ask by what authority you venture on board this craft and merely frighten some of my poor men out of their wits but we are honest peaceably disposed people and have no desire to quarrel with strangers do you mean to say that you hadn't your vessel full of blacks last night whatever since you have done with them exclaimed jack stamping on the deck with indignation as he felt somewhat compromised in the matter be calm young gentleman said the don as i remark suspicions are not proofs i am not accustomed to answer questions as to my movements and therefore would advise you to be silent there was no more to be done on board the felucia although don diego was known to be a slave dealer and guilty of numberless atrocities he could not be touched nor could his craft be detained as the english returned to their boat he bowed and scraped his mouth grinning and his countenance wearing at the same time an expression of the most intense hatred we may meet again gentlemen before long but perhaps you may not find me in so placable a mood as at the present hemming made no answer but the don was seen bowing away and nourishing his sombrero as long as they could see him not a little vexed at the fruitless result of their expedition hemming and his companions pulled to the northward in search of the frigate i cannot make it out observed jack after having been lost in thought for some time i can though said hemming i have not the shadow of a doubt that somehow or other the don got notice that we were in the neighbourhood and that as the slaves were taken in one side of the vessel he sent them back again by the rafts over the other 
had we made a dash at the felucia at once we should have found some of them on board and she would have been condemned we will be wiser in the future it was not till late in the evening that they fell in with the frigate she kept cruising off the bay and two other boats were sent in to watch the felucia but the old don was too wary a bird to be thus easily caught and nothing was seen of the felucia soon after this a steamer hoved in sight and her commander coming on board the ranger informed captain lascelles of an unsuccessful attack having been made on lagos at the same time delivering to him dispatches from mr beecroft the british consul for bight of benin residing at fernando po asking for further assistance sail was instantly therefore made for the northward and the wind holding favourable they were not long before they got off the slave coast in the neighbourhood of the place proposed to be attacked great was the satisfaction expressed by all hands both in the gun-room and the midshipmen's berth and throughout the ship at the prospect of some real work being done in the midshipmen's berth perhaps the satisfaction was more vehemently expressed there is nothing like getting a real enemy right before you and having an honest slap at him exclaimed jack rogers it is all very right hunting down those slave dealers and chasing slavers but the scoundrels are such slippery fellows it is difficult work to get hold of them or to keep them if you have got a grip of them observed adair but i say does anybody know who it is we are going to fight and what we are going to fight about something about the slave trade said hobson one of the mates the blacks hereabout want a thrashing so we are going to lick them remarked lister another midshipman who was never very exact in his notions just then murray who had had the forenoon watch on deck came below he was on the point i have mentioned a great contrast to lister he was forthwith applied to as soon as i have taken the sharp edge off my appetite i will tell you all i know about the matter he answered the edge of people's appetites on the coast is not very sharp in the dog days especially so murray was soon in a condition to begin now just look here he commenced collecting some crumbs and bits of biscuit which he began to place about on the table to the north and east of us is the slave coast inland due north or thereabouts is dahomey the king of which is something like a king for he can cut off the subjects heads at pleasure he has got several regiments of amazons who fight most furiously besides other troops armed with matchlocks to the east is the yeruba country and to the south further round the bay is the kingdom of benin the yeruba country is between the other two i have mentioned its chief river is the ogun at the mouth is lagos a large town held by an independent chief or king of considerable wealth and power about seventy miles up is the abacuta abacuta is a very remarkable place about twenty-five years ago the remnants of the inhabitants of the number of villages which had been broken up by the attacks made on them for the purpose of carrying away these people as slaves betook themselves to a large cavern on the banks of the ogun about seventy miles from the coast in this place of concealment they remained for some time undiscovered living on roots and berries and other natural productions of the ground till they were joined by other fugitives from the hated slave dealers at length their numbers increasing they ventured forth from their cavern and began to cultivate the ground and to build themselves houses they chose as their chief a 
a liberal-minded talented man called shodeki and it is said that at present there are upwards of eighty thousand people in their community they have built a large town which they have called understone or in their own language abikuta in memory of the cave under which they first took shelter now if the blockading squadron had never done more than what i am going to tell you about they would have performed a very great and blessed work among the thousands of negroes they have captured and liberated were many hundreds who had been taken from the yoruba country and who were settled at sierra leone how many of them had grown rich and a considerable portion had been converted to christianity among them was a man named in their language as ogdai but called in english crowther he had been embarked as a slave on board of a slaver at bagatry in eighteen twenty two that slaver was captured by one of our cruisers and taken to sierra leone at that place he was well educated was converted and ordained as a minister of the gospel now several of the yoruba natives i have spoken of who had become possessed of property purchased the vessel and visited lagos and bagari to trade at those places they heard of abiokuta and the stand it had made against the slave trade on their return to sierra leone from the accounts they gave of the new settlement a considerable number of their countrymen resolved to go there among the first was mr crowther he is i am assured a man of high intellectual powers and of eminent piety he persuaded other christian africans to accompany him nearly the first people he met on arriving at the new city were his mother and sisters and they were his first converts the greater part of the inhabitants are now christians and mr crowther is engaged in translating the bible into the yoruba language the king of dahomey looked with an evil eye on the growing power of abiokuta and led his army to destroy it but he and his forces were however more signally defeated on this he instigated the king of lagos to attack abiokuta that chief has got a hundred war canoes fully five thousand men all armed with muskets and sixty guns happily the old king of lagos lately died he left his crown to a fellow called akioi the younger of two sons the elder kosoko being a ragamuffin and banished akioi on coming to the throne recalled kosoko but true to his character the elder brother managed to bribe the army and to turn poor akioi out of the country akitoi took shelter in bagdagari which place kosoko was preparing to attack being promised a thousand men by the king of dahomey if he succeeds he will undoubtedly attack abiokuta to prevent this mr beecroft applied for a naval force to bring kosoko to reason accordingly the bloodhound and a squadron of boats was sent off to lagos to reason with the usurper he however did not understand what they wanted and as they approached opened heavy fire on them from a number of concealed batteries both with great guns and small arms several poor fellows were killed and wounded and at length the expedition had to retire there not being enough men to hold the town had it been captured the commodore has now resolved to send one of ample strength to drive this slave-dealing sovereign kosoko from his throne and his stronghold altogether this is the business we are called on to perform if we succeed and there is no doubt about that i should hope we shall preserve abi okuta and enable the christian missionaries to labor on without interruption we shall punish the usurper and restore the right man to his government 
we shall rout out the nest of slave dealers and put a stop to slave dealing in lagos and we shall teach the king of dahomey to be cautious lest the same punishment we inflict on his friend there may overtake him all these things are well worth fighting for you'll acknowledge all hands agreed that it would be difficult to have a better object than that murray had described for the proposed attack yes indeed it is truly satisfactory feeling to be sure that this cause you fight for is a righteous one repeated murray still i do not hold for one moment that it is not our duty to fight as long as we remain in the service whenever we are ordered by our superiors the difference is this in one case we fight heartily in the other we do only just what we are ordered at all events we don't do it in the same hearty way we would like we'll fight heartily now at all events exclaimed adair with even more than his usual enthusiasm if there is one cause more than another in which i would rather expend my life it would be that of getting rid of this abominable slave trade no scoundrels are greater in my opinion than the fellows who engage in it no country can prosper or be happy which allows it the conversation was cut short by the announcement that several sail of men of war were in sight the ships began working away with their bunting and when they had collected the commanders assembled on board the commodore to arrange the plan of attack the next day by the evening everything was ready the squadron composed of steamers as well as sailing ships brought up off the mouth of the ogun river it has a bar across it inside it on the island about two miles in circumference near the right bank stands the slave-dealing city of lagos whose houses could just be distinguished peeping out among the coconut trees it was known that the place was strongly defended with stockades some sixty guns and from fifteen hundred to two thousand men with firearms and gunners trained by the spaniards and other slave dealers to serve the artillery all hands watched eagerly for the signal to commence operations the three midshipmen were delighted to find that they were to be the first squadron of boats preceded by a steamer they dashed across the bar and then anchored inside out of reach of shot from the town to commence operations the next morning soon after sunrise men were seen assembling on the banks of the river and on pulling over to them they found that mr beecroft with the ex-king akitoe had arrived bringing with him five hundred men from abiokuta and badagri that they might be known they had white net cloths distributed among them with which the black volunteers were highly delighted a number of canoes were then discovered at a slave station on the left bank and these having been brought off the black auxiliary force now considerably augmented was passed over to the right bank the steamer next dropped up the river with the tide to reconnoiter the fortifications and it was found that at all points where boats could land stakes in double rows were driven in while the embankment had been thrown up with a ditch in front of it and that twenty-five guns were trained to guard all the narrower parts of the channel on the north side of the island were the houses of kosoko and the slave dealers and it was here accordingly as it was right that they should be chiefly punished that the commander of the expedition resolved to commence the attack the following day being christmas day he determined in order that that holy day should be spent as quietly as possible and be a day of rest to wait till the twenty sixth this it was except that the slave dealers wasted a large amount of ammunition by firing at the squadron which was far beyond their range 
with infinite satisfaction soon after daybreak on the twenty sixth the order was received to proceed to the attack the scene may be easily pictured before them lay the island surrounded by stockades with palm trees and the huts and houses of lagos rising beyond them the broad river in front of full of shadows narrow channels only between them towards the island the steamers and the squadron of boats now advanced at first all was calm and smiling jack and paddy were in the same boat i wonder whether the scoundrels will give in without fighting observed the latter i shouldn't be surprised not a bit of it answered jack they want first to be taught a lesson or two which they cannot forget but what can these miserable black fellows do against us i should think that we should blow them and their town up into the sky in a dozen minutes or less exclaimed paddy with a laugh scarcely had he spoken when from the whole line of stockades showers of round shot and bullets came rattling about the steamers and boats on dashed the whole squadron the steamers keeping up a hot fire from their great guns in return though so well sheltered were the blacks that not one of them could be seen this sort of work continued for some time several officers and men being hit when one of the steamers grounded she then became of course a target for the enemy and several people were wounded on board her the boats meantime had opened their fire to protect her but so well were the batteries of the negroes concealed that it was difficult to find a point at which to aim a division of the boats was now sent round to the north-east point of the island to ascertain the position and strength of the guns on that side these boats after a hot fight during which they upset some of the enemy's guns returned and then made a gallant attempt to force the stockades in order to land and spike the guns bearing the heaviest on the steamer away they dashed they could see the barrels of the negroes muskets gleaming through the stockades and a terrific fire was open on them still on they went right up to the stockades axe in hand the works were attacked but in vain they hacked and hewed at the tough posts no sooner was one party of blacks driven from the defences than others took their places many of the seamen were hit some poor fellows sank never to rise again the british seamen cheered and loaded and fired rapidly as they could the blacks shrieked and shouted and kept banging away in return jack heard a cry close to him it came from the boat next to his he saw an officer fall his heart sank he thought it was murray he sprang into the boat to lift him up but no it was another gallant young midshipman whom he had seen an instant before bravely cheering on his men assistance was useless he had ceased to breathe he placed him in the stern sheets of his boat and regained his own once more a desperate assault was made on the stockades but without effect and with numbers wounded the boats were compelled to haul off what to do with the steamer on shore was now the question it was resolved to avoid the necessity of blowing her up to land with a strong force to destroy the guns annoying her till the tide rose there seemed no prospect of getting her off some little time was expended in arranging the expedition again the signal was given and in line they pulled gallantly up towards the stockade as they approached a fire from fully fifteen hundred muskets opened up on them to which they replied with spherical grape and canister shot hotter and hotter grew the fire of the blacks but on the boats steadily advanced till their stems touched the beach when the men springing on shore formed in an instant and led by their officers rushed up to the stockades axes were plied vigorously 
some seized the timbers and hauled them down and a breach was being made in they rushed and drove the enemy before them the fort was gained the blacks fled out of it into the thick bush in the rear and all the guns were spiked while this work was being accomplished a party of the blacks had come down and attacking one of the boats had carried her off along the beach hoping probably to make their escape in her a party pursued them on discovering this for a considerable distance when the blacks who had fled into the woods seeing what was taking place rushed from their concealment in the woods by swarms and poured a crushing fire into the boats at pistol range one poor fellow who had been left on board the boat when he saw the enemy coming made a desperate attempt to spike her guns and was cut down while so engaged after all the boat could not be recovered the crewmen on board mr beecroft's boat by mistake let go her anchor directly in front of the enemy's lines and had not an officer in the most gallant way cut her chain cable with a chisel under a fearfully hot fire during which he was several times hit she also would have been destroyed everybody during the action behaved admirably and no one deserved more praise than did the surgeon sent on the expedition who throughout the day attended on the wounded exposed to the hottest fire disastrous in one respect had indeed been the result of the expedition for upwards of sixty men and officers had been wounded and thirteen men and three midshipmen killed while it was found that the boat could not be recovered a mate of one of the ships and the gunner in most a gallant way pulled back to the cutter and by throwing a rocket into her so well directed that it entered her magazine blew her up destroying at the same time not a few of her captors towards the evening the steamer was got off and the order was then given for the boats to return out of gunshot for the night british seamen are not apt to indulge in low spirits or to give way to melancholy but those engaged in the expedition might well have been excused had they done so had they been successful the case would have been different but as yet nothing had been accomplished still probably there was not a man who did not feel that before the end of another day something would be done nor did any one dream of abandoning the enterprise jack and adair looked out anxiously for murray can he have been hit said terence it surely was not his boat that was taken i trust not indeed answered jack anxiously i'll hail the boats as they come up to learn if anybody knows where he is boat after boat was hailed but no information could be obtained of murray they became seriously anxious about him jack had several men wounded in his boat and one poor fellow lay stark and cold in the bow the other boats had also several wounded on board them while the steamer had a still greater proportion the groans and cries of the poor fellows as they lay racked with pain in the confined space which could alone be afforded on board the small vessels and boats sounded sadly in the calm midnight air the surgeons all the time were stepping from boat to boat or visiting the vessels in succession and doing their utmost to alleviate the sufferings of the wounded happy were those who could sleep but many among whom jack and terence could not close an eye how anxiously as they leaned back and looked up to the dark skies studded with its myriad of stars reflected in the calm glassy waters did they wish for the morrow though that morrow might bring death and wounds to themselves or their companions happy indeed is it for all of us that we do not know what the morrow may bring forth End of chapter twenty one